everybody. We're ready to start. Hi, Carol. Us. Um, we don't I'm see you. Ask, I just got in. You don't need to see me. What I want to ask is for each of you, please to mute yourself because with so many of us, we don't want to hear any background noises. Okay. And, 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 and when you want to ask questions of our speaker, you find the chat option. It's usually at the bottom center of your screen. And you can type your questions in there. And at intervals, when they have a break in their talk or when it's appropriate, they'll answer your questions that way. Um, the other thing I'm going to suggest is in the upper, usually in the upper right hand corner, you can toggle between speaker view and gallery view. Gallery view shows you everybody. Speaker view shows you the person who's speaking. And if you use speaker view, it will be more satisfactory because you'll see our speakers up large. So today's speakers are first Linda Deutsch, who's an award-winning journalist who spent a half century with the Associated Press covering dozens of high profile trials, including those of Charlie Manson, Sirhan Sirhan, the Menendez brothers, the Rodney King police officers, O.J. Simpson and Michael Jackson. She's a native of New Jersey where her alma mater, Monmouth University, recently dedicated its newsroom as the Linda Deutsch Student Journalism Center. Since her retirement in 2015, Linda has been a frequent guest on true crime TV shows. Our second speaker is Lori Levinson, a professor of law at Loyola Law School and the David W. Burcham Chair in Ethical Advocacy. She served as a federal prosecutor prior to joining Loyola and is the founding director of Loyola's Project for the Innocent. Professor Levinson has provided legal commentary on many high profile cases from Rodney King to O.J. Simpson to Michael Jackson to the current cases in the news. Together, Linda and Lori have witnessed many trials together with Lori providing legal expertise for many of Linda's stories. Today, they'll be discussing what there is to learn from high profile cases and how the justice system has had to adjust to our changing times. Welcome, Linda and Lori. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much, Carol. We are really delighted to be here and thrilled to be able to share with you the great Linda Deutsch. I think I just introduced oh. her, frankly, as a legend, and I'm, not, I'm lucky enough to accompany Linda Deutsch to this program. We're gonna have a lot of fun, but learn something today during this program, and I do welcome you to put questions in the chat. We'll get to them, and we'll save some time at the end as well. But let's start out with our dear friend, Linda Deutsch, and just ask her about her amazing career as a reporter covering what we call the trials of the century. As many of you know, we have a trial of the century about every six months just here in Los Angeles, and Linda has covered them all. But there's a lot more to know about Linda before I let her talk about herself. It's not just that she's a journalist extraordinaire, truly the best in the nation, but she has this other past you should know about <laughs> as the president of the Elvis Fan Club. So I'm gonna let Linda tell you a little bit about both that and being the AP reporter, I'm sorry, on all of these cases. Linda, take it away. Laura, you are much too kind as usual. Um, I am a little flummoxed here with what I'm supposed to be looking at, uh, but I guess I can just talk, eh? Yeah, I've got pictures up of you as an AP reporter, but when okay. you mention that Elvis guy, I'm going back to that picture as well. Okay, great. Um, I am delighted to be here with Lori, who is my, I call her my legal muse and my dear, dear friend over more than 20 years now. It's hard to believe. And I'm delighted to be back with the wise years. Um, I have spoken to your group before in person. Uh, not on Zoom, and it's always a pleasure. And I thank my cousin, Lana Sternberg, for being the facilitator of these appearances. She always nudges me to come and speak. And, uh, and it's, it's always a pleasure. Um, I talked to Lana about this a little before we set it up, and I thought I would start by telling you about my background and how I came to be who I am. Um, 
I was the girl from the Jersey Shore and uh, I was raised at the Jersey Shore and I was from the time I was born I think I wanted to write my mother said I came out carrying a pencil um, I was a writer all along um, I loved newspapers when I was a child and at some point when I was about 10 years old my my beloved father realized that this was my passion writing and for my 10th birthday he surprised me with a gift that was the ultimate gift a typewriter a real typewriter it was the smith corona i still have it it took me through the rest of my professional life until computers were invented and it was an incredible gift and i realized that i could communicate with it so when I was 12 years old, I made another discovery, which was that I adored rock and roll, and particularly a guy named Elvis, who I discovered very early on. And I started one of the first Elvis fan clubs in the country. And I realized that there were a lot of people out there that wanted to know more about him. He was then an unknown. And so I had 300 members in my fan club all over the world, and I decided to put out a newspaper for them. And that was how it all got launched. That was how I started in communicating to a worldwide audience. And it was pretty amazing for someone my age. Um, when I went on to high school, uh, I had a very important mentor who was my uncle, uh, Marvin Sosna, who was a newspaper man. He was my mother's brother and he was already working in newspapers. He knew that I wanted to write and that I'd been talking about how I would become a poet. And he said, no, 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 you're you're not going to be a poet. It doesn't pay. And, uh, and you need to get through school and you need to have a way to earn a living. Um, I came from rather modest means. And so I followed in his footsteps, basically, and started writing for the um, high school paper and for the local paper as a freelancer. By the time I got to college, I knew what I was going to be. And I had a, another mentor, a um, professor who taught, the, the college did not have a journalism department at that time. I majored in English. And my professor, Frank Demetrowitz, came to me at the end of my sophomore year and said, you have to get a job this summer. You're already doing the work of, of a working journalist. It's time for you to really work. And he got me a job on a newspaper in New Jersey, which was in the town where I had been born, Perth Amboy. And I, was, I had a weird shift. I never saw anybody because I worked at night. But one night, one day, one night, I was reading the paper and saw a notice that said there was going to be a civil rights march on Washington. I certainly was familiar with the civil rights movement and I thought Washington's not that far from here. So I left a note on the editor's desk that night and said, don't you think we should cover this? I mean, I was 18 years old. I wasn't gonna say I should go cover it. Um, but the next morning he called me at home and he said, so you wanna cover this, huh? And I said, I really would like to go. And he said, okay, here's the deal. You can go, but it can't cost us anything. That was my first lesson in journalistic economics. And so I called the NAACP chapter in Perth Amboy. And I said, um, you know, I, I hear there's this March. I know you're going, can I come with you? And they said, we'd love to have you. And so I went with the NAACP group. I heard Martin Luther King give his amazing I Have a Dream speech. I got back in time to write my story and it was my first front page byline. After that, I've often said there was no turning back. <laughs> and so I continued on with college. Um, I graduated with a degree in English. Um, covered a lot of important things while I was in college, 
and worked for the local paper, the Asbury Park Press on weekends. Then I had to decide what I was going to do. And my uncle said, go west, young woman. He suggested I come to California. I had applied for his jobs in New York, but nobody was hiring. It was a tough time for newspapers then, much as it is now. And so I went to California and I got a, a temporary job in San Bernardino of all places. And, but I went and I interviewed at three places, the Los Angeles Times, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner and the Associated Press. And the AP, God bless them, hired me on site. They looked at my clips, they said, you're hired, you, you start in January. And so I, I, it was a very fortuitous time for me to get there because it was 1967 and in 1968, all hell started breaking loose in Los Angeles and around the country with the assassinations and trials. And with that, I think I will stop for a little bit. I'm going to go on about the trials, but now you know how I got there and I'm gonna turn it over to Lori to tell you a little bit about her career. Before I do that, I want to give you the update on Linda's career, because she was too humble to do so. Because of her career and her many accomplishments. Lori, you're muted. Am I on now? Can yes. you hear me now? OK. Uh, Linda was a little humble there because she only gave you the first part of her career and didn't say what was recognized at the end of her career. And that is they have now at her alma mater named the Journalism Center after Linda Deutsch. So there is much to tell. I apologize for the muting. Uh, it's usually kind of hard to keep me quiet. And so I'll tell you a little bit about my background now as well. So I am folks, a nerdy law professor by profession. I wasn't always that, I was a federal prosecutor. And I think that's actually how I met Linda way back when, right. when she was covering cases in the federal court. Now I never had anything that big, although I did my job. And when I left the US Attorney's Office, which by the way, my daughter is at now, um, I became a professor. And I thought I would just be that nerdy professor, but things are different in LA. And I started to get calls about the trials that were happening. My big coverage probably started with the Rodney King case and went on from there. And I, when I went down to cover the cases, I just thought I was answering questions. Now I was lucky enough to answer questions for people like Linda Deutsch, but I also started answering questions for people from CBS. I certainly didn't confuse myself as a movie star. You know, no one thought I was Sharon Stone, but I was comfortable answering questions. And that's always what I've seen my role to be. I have covered many of these trials with Linda. She is amazing with a typewriter or a phone or a pen. And my job as I see it is simply to give her the background in the law so that she can cover them as well as she clearly does. In addition, in my real world, as has been mentioned, I run Loyola's Project for the Innocent something that we created at the law school to help people who've been wrongfully convicted. It has been a joy and a calling. This is a picture from representing Maria Mendez, who was a grandmother who spent 12 years in prison for a crime she did not commit. But we've had other clients who've spent decades, 34 years, 32 years. And by doing that work, I keep a foot in the courtroom on my own cases Plus, I'm able to get down there to watch some of the big cases that we talk about. We're going to start with Linda's first big case, and I think that's the case of Charlie Manson. So, Linda, what was it like covering the Manson case, and how did you end up doing that? Well, that really was the launching point for my career as a, as a trial journalist, as a legal journalist. Um, I should mention that um, there are people who would watch my stories online after I met Lori, and if it didn't have her name in the story, they knew I didn't really write it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
1969, I was a cub reporter. I had been with the AP about a year. Um, the first case that I was thrown into was the Sirhan case. Uh, when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in Los Angeles, I was in the AP bureau that night. My shift started at midnight and he was killed at 12.05. And I will never forget that night as long as I live. Uh, I was in the bureau and people started screaming that our, our reporter on the scene had just called in and Kennedy had been shot. Um, I, at that time, had no inkling that I would be covering trials. Uh, I had covered courts in New Jersey, but nothing big. And I, my actual ambition then was to cover Hollywood. I mean, I came from, New, from Asbury Park, New Jersey to Hollywood is quite a, a distance and I was dazzled by it. But when that happened, I was thrown in, I was a general assignment reporter, I covered a lot of it, and then I was tr thrown in as the backup reporter for two reporters who came out from New York to cover the Sirhan trial. So I would do the, the side interviews and I would be in the courtroom periodically. And many, many years later, when I covered Sirhan's parole hearings, he actually looked at me and went, he recognized me, which I was surprised at. And uh, so that was number, that was the first trial, really. And then um, in 69, I was covering a routine story. I was at the airport in Orange County to meet the airplane of the new president, Richard Nixon, who was coming out to see his Western White House in San Clemente. And we always had a thing at the AP that a reporter would be at the airport when a president landed and you'd call in and say, he's, he's landed and everything's okay. So I called in and said, he's landed and everything's okay. And I heard hysteria on the other end of the line. They said, forget about Nixon, get in here as fast as you can. There's been an incredible mass murder. We, we have to cover this right away. So I raced into the bureau. I heard on the radio that it was um, the wife of director Roman Polanski and other famous people who had been killed. Uh, my Hollywood background actually did serve me well because I, I knew who Polanski was. I knew who Sharon Tate was. And I knew some of the other people, Jay Sebring. Um, and, and, and Linda, it, let, me, let me ask a couple of questions with regard to it. First was, what was it like? What was unusual about the trial itself? And the second thing is, you've always said, and I think it's something for us to always realize, that trials are a snapshot of society. No one case represents everything, but this right. one did represent a lot. Well, the trial did not happen for quite a while because the actual um, killers were not caught for three months. It was a terrible time in LA, everybody was terrified. Once they were caught, um, my first really vivid memory at the courthouse is the day that Charlie Manson was brought in for arraignment. Much as you see him there with the, the beard and the jail jumpsuit, uh, except he was wearing a fringed suede jacket. And he came in shuffling in and at that time, they allowed cameras in the hallway of the courthouse. And there were so many cameras and they all surged forward at the same time and they knocked out a, a water fountain on the wall and the whole hallway was flooded. And <laughs> it was just to give you an idea of how big a case that was. Um, it, at that time, I did not realize, and I wouldn't realize for a number of years, that I was basically covering social history. Uh, I had become kind of a social historian. The Manson trial was the trial of the 60s. It was the trial of flower power, of hippies, of drugs, and sex, and rock and roll, basically. And uh, later, I would go on to do the Angela Davis trial, which was the trial of the Black Power movement. Um, there were, you know, so many others that reflected what was going on in our society. The Daniel Ellsberg's Pentagon Papers trial, the trial of the Vietnam War. Um, it was a time of great upheaval in our country. 
And when, if you wanted to know what really was happening, all you had to do was go into a courtroom and you would see it. Uh, the Manson trial was something that no one could have written a script for or understood. Uh, when you look at these pictures, the one down on the left is me on the phone in the hallway outside the courtroom. Um, and there are the three women who were on trial with him. Um, it was a drama every single day. Can you share with our viewers a little bit of the craziness of Charlie Manson in a courtroom? Yeah, it was, um, Manson would come in and act out and he had told the, the women to act out as well. So they would come in singing or yelling at the judge. One day Manson got up, leaped across the council table with a pencil in his hand and screamed, someone should cut your head off old man and that was the judge <laughs> um and the judge said arrest that stop that man they, they acted up so much that for, for a time they were not even in the courtroom they, they had to listen from an ante room um and have you still stayed in contact with i mean charlie manson's dead but i just want to add one thing which was uh -huh. that outside the courtroom the members of manson's family camped on the sidewalk outside on Temple Street. They lived there and they gave interviews there and they advocated for him. And it was it was truly a scene. Any, any reporter in town would come to see it. And they were young and they were sad, vulnerable creatures. And I remember that one day I interviewed Sandra Good, who was one of the followers, and I said, uh, how would your life have been different if you hadn't met Charlie? And she said, well, my parents wanted me to marry a doctor or a lawyer or a senator. She came from that kind of family, and so did a lot of them. So it was, it was incredible. I just want one more point on this, and we'll go on to another trial. But I, you've been in contact, and some of the women have been up for parole. Now, that's yeah. not likely to happen, as your muse has told you over and over again. Right. Nobody ever forgets the Manson case. But right. from your perspective, is history too harsh? De well, it definitely is as far as Leslie Van Houten goes. I have been in touch with her since I retired. She is the girl on the right. And she doesn't look like that anymore. She's now over 70 years old. She's been in prison all that time. Um, she was the least vul uh, vulnerable of all, uh, the most vulnerable of all of them, the youngest. She was 19 when it happened. She wrote to me right after I retired. Apparently my retirement was big news at the prisons. <laughs> and uh, she uh, sent me a lovely letter and said that she just wanted to thank me because all these years, she knew I had been fair to her and she had seen me in the, in the room with her during the uh, parole hearings and we had not been able to talk. And she, she said she hoped that she wasn't being too forward reaching out to me. And I wrote back to her and said, I would love to come and visit you. And I did. And I have now visited her at least five times. I was supposed to go right before the pandemic. Um, and we have become friends. Um, She's an incredible woman. She has redeemed herself over and over again. She has earned two degrees while in prison, a, a bachelor's and a master's degree. She has mentored so many other women and helped them through their time in prison. And she's trying to get parole and she's been approved three times now by the parole board. And each time the governors would not let her out. And I think it's just political. It is political. Linda, with your permission, we're gonna jump ahead. You mentioned Sirhan. I don't know if there's anything more to say about the case other than my quick story, mm -hmm. that when Sirhan was arrested on the scene, Rosie Greer, who was a football player, broke his hand. And they, of course, everyone was crying, but they took Sirhan to the hospital and the doctors would not treat him because of what he'd done, except for one doctor who had taken a Hippocratic oath. And my friends, that was my father of beloved mm -hmm. memory. I want to talk, though, about these guys, because yeah. that's kind of when I started launching on the screen. The first high profile case I ever saw was actually in the Tenderloin of uh, San Francisco, 
when I was just out of college and it was the Patty Hearst case. And I, was I think covering. Linda was there. Everyone knew Linda as well. But we had our own versions of cases down here. And I always teach my students about the theater of the courtroom. It is not just the law and it's not just rules of evidence. There's real theater. Linda, can you help share about what happened in the Menendez boys, as I call them, the Menendez brothers case? Yes. Um, Eric and Lyle Menendez came from a, an upper class family in Beverly Hills. They lived oddly enough on Elm Drive. And uh, one day in Beverly Hills, the call went out that there had been a homicide, double homicide in Beverly Hills, which is unheard of. And the parents of Eric and Lyle Menendez, Jose and Kitty, were found shot to death in their living room, shotgunned. And it was a pretty gruesome scene. The boys were, uh, let's see, Eric was there and Lyle and they were crying and they said they didn't know what had happened. And for days they were not even suspects, but eventually there was a break in the case and they were arrested for the murders of their parents. The woman you see in the picture is the very famous Leslie Abramson, who was their lawyer and she was actually Eric's lawyer. And, um, and she set the tone for the entire trial. And you talk about theater, this was theater. Um, it was in a way that theater is always, always pulls at your heart and your emotions. We came to know a very important thing, which, which was a social breakthrough at that time. And that was that the young men had been sexually abused by their, their father. Uh, it was something that had never been alleged in a high profile case before. There were people who didn't believe it. And only now, all these years later, has it become obvious that what they were saying was true. Um, Leslie decided she would play on their youth. And that's why you see them in the sweaters, which they wore every day to court. They, uh, they were already actually uh, in their 20s, but they looked younger. And, uh, and she came up with this theory that, uh, yes, they killed their parents, but it was to save their lives. Right, and they, so folks, to the extent you've ever heard the abuse excuse phrase, that's launched by this case where there was the question of, you know, how that would be a defense to shotgunning your parents while they're filling out your college applications. But the jury didn't convict the first time out. They were somewhat moved by this, right, Linda? They were, and it was a, it was a hung jury. Uh, they were divided. And after the hung jury, Leslie actually allowed me to come to a meeting with all of the jurors at her home to talk about it. And they were absolutely convinced that the boys had been abused. Um, the prosecutor had been vehement that they were not. She was the one that, that coined the term abuse excuse. And um, the judge ordered a new trial. And the second trial was completely different from the first in that most of the evidence of abuse was not allowed into evidence. Uh, he seemed determined to get them convicted, and he did. And uh, folks, you know, I'm often asked because it's not unusual in high profile cases to not have a conviction the first time out. And, uh, you know, when people ask me, for example, what was the difference between Rodney King 1 and Rodney King 2, or Menendez 1 and Menendez 2, or OJ 1 and OJ Civil, it's the evidence. I think the evidence does very much change. Yeah. Can we move on to the Rodney King case for a second, Linda? Sure. Um, this one was the first case that I was covering on television. Uh, for those of you who think that television work is glamorous, uh, frankly, I work from about 4 a.m. to 11 p.m. to be able to cover the morning shows, the afternoon evening shows. I happened to be nursing my kid at the same time, but she got weaned really quickly. <laughs> and I think this case had tremendous meaning to Los Angeles, some of which was reverberating today. Absolutely. Those of us who remember, right, Linda, there was the first verdict in Simi Valley where the officers lived, came back with a not guilty, and then the feds came in and retried it, uh, and two of the defendants were found guilty. But in between, 
but there the was one, a riot. Yeah, right? the one that I remember is best, although I covered three Rodney King trials. Uh, the one I remember best is in Simi Valley. I actually moved up there during the trial because it was too far to commute. And on the day, and, and every single day we saw the tape but, and that's when videotape was not that common in courts. There were no iPhones then. People did not tape crimes. But this man who was in the neighborhood and had just gotten a camera as a gift, took the video of these police officers just wailing away at King, beating him, kicking him. I never saw that video that I didn't flinch. It was horrible. But didn't showing that video over and over again somewhat desensitize the jury? I don't, I don't think that was it. I think that it was the jury as it was chosen in a town. The judge insisted on moving the case out of Los Angeles, and he moved it to a place that was convenient for him to get to, which was Simi Valley. It was a, a brand new courthouse in a town that was a bedroom community for police officers. Everyone on that jury had a connection to the police department in one way or another. Um, it was not, you know, when you went into the courthouse, it was pristine. It was not like downtown LA where you would see what's going on in the world. It was like trying the case in a cocoon. And um, on the day of the verdict, uh, we went into the courtroom. And I remember that I was sitting next to another reporter, Norma Meyer from Copley, and, uh, and they announced not guilty. And she looked at me and she said, well, I guess we can cover the riots now. Wow, and I, I just wanna jump in on that regard, which is there was a tremendous response. Now, none of us think that the riots were alone based upon the verdict in this case. Mm -hmm. It triggered something very deep in Los Angeles, which we continued to live with. Right. But that impact and the mayor coming out and the mayor saying, you know, this isn't what I saw led to the federal authorities. I still get the question of wasn't it double jeopardy? So just to clear that up, no. Mm -hmm. State and federal authorities are two different groups and the feds did come in. But again, I think the feds did a much better job in the case. For one thing, in the state case, they were afraid to call Rodney King, afraid that he would look like some you know, big monster. He looked pathetic on the stand in the federal case. The feds used the grand jury to lock the officers into statements that they could impeach them. There were some really weird moments in the federal trial when Melanie Singer, who's a big CHP officer, um, she testified and people asked me, what kind of questions do I get from journalists? Well, from Linda Deutsch, I get really smart questions, but I remember from other journalists, I was asked, why is she wearing chiffon? Like somehow my law degree qualified me for questions for that. Yeah. Um, you know, people think that the only reasons the officers were convicted in this case were because of payback, but I'm not sure that's true. And I'll say one last thing. This is a case that had an impact on the community. I didn't have a special pass into the courtroom. I got in line at about 1.30 in the morning to get a seat in the courtroom. And next to me was a woman who came from the Compton area. And I looked at her, I said, I'm a sugar, but why are you here? <laughs> and uh, she said, because it was my community that burned to the ground. Yeah. I wanna see if there's justice. So Linda, what's it like trying to cover a case when you know that so much is at stake? Well, it's heartbreaking. Um, that is not one trial. On? Somebody's got a phone on? Oh, uh, it was the one case that I always said almost destroyed my belief in the justice system. Because I believed that if you went into a courtroom and came in with the evidence and had both sides being civil to each other and trying it, that you could come to a reasonable conclusion. And, and it would be the right conclusion. Well, in this case, they came to the wrong conclusion. And on the day after, the, as the riots were still raging, I could not get back into Los Angeles. I, uh, I stayed in Simi Valley and I began trying to track down the jurors. And I found a juror who was in tears. I went to her house and she said that she had tried 
to hang that jury. She had tried to get them not to come in with those not guilty verdicts and that she was threatened by them, that they locked her in her room and told her she'd never come out if she didn't vote with them. That story got almost no traction because by then everybody was covering the riots. Yeah. Um, and it was, it, and it, the riots led me to think that sometimes justice didn't work. But then the, the um, federal trial was a different story. Um, it was too late to save a lot of the businesses that were ruined and the millions of dollars of damage. And, you know, you have to remember that uh, Daryl Gates, who was then chief of police, left his office while the riots yeah. were breaking out. Linda, can I, can I break in on that? Yeah. Not only did Gates leave, but he, the police department didn't report in. So right. let me scare some of you out there with the following factual information. The only law enforcement protecting the West Side from Robertson to the beach were six uni cops from UCLA. Mm -hmm. That's what happened to our city at yeah. the time. I'm gonna push Linda on so we can, can I get ready. Say, I wanna tell one little tidbit, one little anecdote uh, to, to lighten the, the idea. Lori was with us in the press room throughout all of the oh. Rodney King. She was in the press room in the federal building and Purim came. And Lori Levinson arrived with Humantaschen for all of the press members. She always kept her Yiddishkeit in mind one way or another. Thank you, Linda. Um, one of the things in that regard, I would come in on Friday with a challah for uh, the press corps. And on the Friday before the verdict in Rodney King, I brought a challah and, and the press corps was so excited about this that one gentleman said, let me, let me make the bracha. And he got up there with the challah and he said, Baruch atah Danai, Elohinu melchom, Borei Peri Hagafen. Which for those of you know is the wrong prayer, but he made an effort. Oh. Um, in that regard, let's go to the biggie of them all. Yeah. And if you don't have this book, you should get Linda's books. Uh, Linda, there's never been, and I don't know that there ever will be another case like OJ, but how do you see it? It was, um, well, for my career, it, it put me before the camera for the first time. I was a print reporter and, uh, and everybody knew my byline and knew me in the courthouse, but I had not been a figure on television. And um, Judge Ito knew me. And so did Jerry Ann Hazlett, who was the spokesperson for the courts. And when they realized how big this was, and it was huge, um, they realized there would not be enough room in the courtroom for all the reporters during jury selection. So I was chosen as the pool reporter. And that meant I had been a pool reporter when I'd covered the Western White House, but that's a whole different thing. You're just reporting to other reporters. I had to go down to the lobby of the courthouse and there were cameras that put me on the air in front of 4 million people. And I gave a report at every break. And that led to a, a memorable moment when the attorney Robert Shapiro came down after I spoke, he got up and he said, I just want to issue a complaint. This reporter is too objective. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, I really marvel at how Linda got through the case. I, I want to share with folks sort of my perspective on OJ. It's different from Linda. Linda will stand by and say that the acquittal was correct. And maybe it was because of the pretty terrible lawyering by the prosecutors in the case. Mm -hmm. But looking back on the case, you know, the prosecutors made a lot of mistakes. Having OJ try on the gloves with a glove underneath, who does things like that? Calling Mark Furman when everybody knew, of course, he had used that terrible N word. Um, you know, boring the jury to death with DNA evidence that they weren't following, and mainly Marsha Clark picking a jury that from the beginning she didn't listen to her jury consultant, and it was likely to end up in this bad result. So we can look back at the OJ case and what did we learn from it? Well, you know, we started to focus on things like celebrity justice. We started to learn about DNA. Uh, when I look at OJ, uh, whether or not he was acquitted of this case or not, he had been arrested eight times on complaints about domestic violence. And then there was all of the information about should we have cameras in the courtroom? 
And my reaction is, of course we should. Mm -hmm. Not because of entertainment, but because you should see what's going on. There is Linda Deutsch, but very few other reporters who can give you that perspective. And finally, the public was paying attention. Race is an issue in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. Celebrity is an issue in the courtroom. Who can afford justice? What defense lawyers are like? And the public started to pay attention. Right. Linda. Right. Um, I, I have to say, though, that after watching all of the evidence for the whole year, it was a year long trial. Um, a few days before the jury came in with their verdict, Marsha Clark, the prosecutor, came up to my office on the 18th floor. We knew each other from previous cases. We were kind of friends. And she said to me, do you think we even have a chance? And I said, your only chance is if there's a hung jury. Otherwise, you don't. And a couple of days later, they came in. And it was not a hung jury. It was an acquittal. And I could have predicted it. I mean, people said they looked at the audience and Dominic Dunn was sitting there next to me with his mouth hanging open, stunned. And I was, and they said, and you were taking notes like it was another day of DNA testimony. <laughs> and uh, I was quickly taking down everything. You know, when you're in a courtroom and you're a reporter, you have to have eyes in the back of your head. You have to see everything, see the audience, see the family, see the witness, see the lawyers, see the judge. It's quite a job. And, uh, and when he was acquitted, um, it was after that that the second part of my relationship with this case began because um, I covered the second trial, but uh, after the first trial, when he finally got out of jail, I was back east already um, on a vacation because my uh, bureau chief said, you've been working hard enough, go get away. So I went to New Jersey to visit friends and I get a call and it's the bureau in Los Angeles saying hey, OJ Simpson is trying to reach you. And it was unbelievable. I mean, how could that be? But it was. And uh, they told me that when he, when he called the bureau, the, the um, secretary yelled out to the entire newsroom, there's somebody on the phone that thinks he's OJ Simpson and wants to talk to Linda. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he was put in touch with me on the phone. I interviewed him on the phone. It was a press talk about pressure. It was the first time he had spoken to a reporter since he was arrested. And I immediately called the AP in New York and told them what I had and dictated a story. And they said, well, you have to get in here right away. And there's going to be people wanting to interview you. So I jumped in my car. It was like midnight. I got lost getting there, but I drove down, downtown to New York. I went into the bureau and within minutes of my arrival, there were people wanting to interview me because now I had become the voice of OJ Simpson. I had spoken to him and uh, it was weird. It was like uh, from beginning at 6 a.m. there were like serial limousines picking me up to go to the morning shows, to go to Larry King, to go to everybody. In fact, um, everybody got confused because I was with my girlfriend in Neptune, New Jersey. And the AP had a, a policy at that time that the dateline on the story had to be where the reporter was. So they go and they file this OJ story with a Neptune dateline. <laughs> And yeah. every the Neptune Police Department was overwhelmed with calls. Yeah. They thought he was there. And Larry King, when he came on, said, and Linda Deutsch was vacationing in her vacation home in Neptune, New Jersey. And my friend said her daughter was in a restaurant and they heard this on TV and somebody turned to his date and he said, who the hell vacations in Neptune? There you go. All right, we've got... One more case to get to, but we have your questions. Oh, it's wait a minute. I should add one thing, which is. But I'm going to tell people to start doing their work. Put those I'm questions in, in the chat. I'm still in touch with OJ. Okay. I talk to him. There were a lot of interesting people from the OJ case. Um, there was a guy named Jeff Tubin who was covering <laughs> the case at the time. And I walked into the press room and said, Who needs a place to go for Seder? And we had uh, 72 people. 
<laughs> come to Seder and Linda still comes. And I want to tell you, she rides a camel, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, hey, folks, the last one we really do want to mention is Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. And that was way up in Santa Maria. Linda was nice enough to let me sort of stay at her uh, hotel because she had to move up there. But again, um, he's gone, but the memory of this case isn't. By the way, you know, my full legal commentary on OJ Simpson came down to the last comment I was asked when Dan Rather said on live TV, so Professor Levinson, what does this case say about justice? Now, I want you all to think about what you would say. He said in the 10 seconds remaining. And I said, it's an issue that will be debated for years to come. Right. And having us here today proves that. Now, Michael Jackson, you knew Michael Jackson as well. I and did. you knew this case, Linda. Yeah. Um, like OJ Simpson, who called me because he said that he appreciated my being fair to him in the trial, Michael Jackson also called me. History repeated itself. I was in Neptune again. My girlfriend just about plots when the phone rang and they said, um, we hear Michael Jackson wants to talk to you. And it was this prince in Bahrain where he was staying after the trial said, Michael Jackson is on the line. And he got on and he said that he just wanted to thank me for being fair to him. And I had to, he wanted to just say that and get off, but I had to make him talk a little more because I needed a story. And I said, Michael, what was the trial like for you? And he said, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life. And that I believe. Um, it was a, a tough trial to cover because everybody had an opinion. There was an, an enormous segment of the, of the press who had spent their entire careers trying to convict Michael Jackson of something. Uh, it was really very disturbing to me. And so I, in that trial, unlike any other I've covered out of town, I had nobody to hang out with. I had one friend, Nina Zacuto of NBC, who she and I would go to dinner together, but I couldn't talk to anyone else because when I did, <coughs> excuse me, these uh, tabloid reporters would go on their site and quote me. And I think my most memorable moment was every day when we came to the courtroom, we had to line up behind a chain link fence and the deputies would come and march us into the courtroom to our seats. On the other side of the chain link fence were uh, Jackson fans who came every day and they had a chant which went, Mike goes innocent, Mike goes innocent, the press are liars, the press are liars. And I would just quietly wave at them. Well, one day I'm waiting outside and these young girls are there with their placards getting ready to demonstrate. And they called out to me and they said, Miss Deutsch, Miss Deutsch, we need to talk to you. And I thought, oh no, what have I done now? But I went over and they said, we want you to know that when we say the press are liars, we don't mean you. We read you on the internet every day and we know that you're unbiased. And folks, I- That was a badge of honor. I think that is the biggest badge of honor. I will say this, obviously I look at cases through the eyes of both the prosecutor and now running an innocence project, people have been wrongfully convicted. I wasn't a huge fan of Michael Jackson. I thought his music was great, but I thought he had a very odd lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, but I happen to agree on this one with Linda and the proof to me that he didn't do this crime. It doesn't mean that he never did anything inappropriate right. with young boys, which I think he did, and he's settled out on some cases. But there was very good lawyering. And that often is it. Tom Mesro was the defense lawyer and he cross-examined the young man and it looked exactly like he had been fed a script to mm -hmm. bring the case. And Linda was able to communicate that to people who are actually following the trial. The problem is that the public doesn't really follow trials. They look for the headlines that back what they wanna think about the case, mm -hmm. but they're not Linda George in there following it every day. Linda, we're start getting questions here and one is about DeLorean. Are ah. you willing to talk a little bit about the DeLorean case? Sure. 
the DeLorean case was the reason I didn't cover the 84 Olympics. So I always remember the year, it was 1984. Um, DeLorean was um, somebody who was a glamor figure. To me, that case was symbolic of the 80s. He had a glamorous defendant with a gorgeous wife and he was charged with trafficking in the drug of choice at the time, cocaine. He also had invented a beautiful fast car that was used in the Back to the Future movies. The case involved overseas because he was producing it in, in Ireland. It has so many uh, elements that made it a big story. He also had been a big figure in Detroit where he had been with General Motors and he left to start his own car company. Um, there were people that came from all over the country and from Ireland and England who came to cover the trial. Um, there was um, great lawyering in that case as well. And one lawyer became quite famous for it, Howard Weitzman. He would hold uh, press conferences on the steps of the courthouse every day. The prosecutor uh, never spoke, never commented. However, um, we, the press, had a big challenge in that case, which was that um, the judge didn't know what to do because the prosecutor, while he didn't comment, he filed documents with specious claims in them. I mean, in one of them, he claimed that Michael Jackson was in league with the IRA in Ireland, which was absolutely untrue. You mean DeLorean, DeLorean. I'm sorry, DeLorean. <laughs> Uh, I'm looking at the picture of Michael. Put up a picture of DeLorean. Um, yeah, DeLorean, that DeLorean was in league with the IRA, which was absolutely untrue, but it brought out huge headlines. And, it, and he was afraid the jury was going to be impacted. So he issued an order sealing every document filed in the case. I, you know, I've never heard of that. And it, it, the order went in on the night before Christmas and, and someone called me from the clerk's office and said, I think you'd better see what the judge did. And wow. I ran down to the courthouse. I got our lawyer on Christmas Eve, the AP lawyer, to start filing documents. And we filed for reconsideration. Judge, judge um, Takasugi, who was later one of my greatest friends, refused to consider it. A special uh, hearing was ordered on a Saturday because this was such a huge issue whether a judge could actually seal documents before they were filed. I had to, I was lucky that I had a lawyer hired by the AP who could be in court every single day to challenge every document that was filed. You know, I, I actually won. Go ahead. I did one better. I married a lawyer who represents the media in these I know. days. He has represented me too. <laughs> and uh, his name is Doug Morrell, by the way. He's terrific. Um, so in the in the big hearing in, in federal court, we won. And all of the documents were unsealed. And it turned out that almost everything that was unsealed were our objections. <laughs> OK, Linda, we have time for about one last quick question. Oh, let me just tell you about the verdict. Ah. If you want to know about DeLorean. Um, the turning point in the DeLorean case, if you're wondering, came on a day when a disaffected DEA agent took the, the witness stand. He was a surprise witness for the defense. His name was Scotty. I can't remember his first name. Um, and he testified that on the day of the famous video, there was a video in this case too, when DeLorean was photographed standing over a suitcase full of cocaine and saying it's better than gold. He said that um, the, um, the prosecutor was in another room with uh, other members of his staff watching this on closed circuit. In fact, at one point they were smoking and they, they were so excited that the smoke alarm went off. But they saw this happen. And when it happened, he said that um, Jim Walsh, the prosecutor, turned to his staff and said, that's it, gentlemen. We're all going to be on the cover of Time magazine. 
Wow. So and that was that was what turned the case because they realized why this had been filed in the first place that DeLorean really hadn't done it, hadn't wanted to do it. In fact, he was pushed into it so many times over again when he said no, uh, that the prosecution was out for glory. There you go. Well, I think our time's up and I want to thank everybody for uh, being with us today. I particularly want to thank Linda. Um, Linda, as you can see, looks not just at facially what's happening in a case, but why it's happening and helps us understand the real world of the courtroom and of us, of our society. She is a gem. There is no one else like her. So all I can do is encourage you to have her back over and over again, because there are many, many more stories to tell. Thank you all. I believe in justice, but I believe in justice because I've been able to learn it through Linda Deutsch and the trials themselves. So and everybody is learning it through Lori Levinson and her classes. She is the ultimate teacher, the ultimate arbiter of what is good in this world. And uh -huh. uh, I, you know, I, I feel proud to be her friend. And because of what she just said, I guess I've got to write that book. You've got to write that book. <laughs> Thank you all for having us. Thank you, Thank Carol. You both very, very much. All right, everyone be well. And don't forget, there are more trials to come. I didn't get any questions, but do I think that there will be trials in New York? That There are trials that are going to be happening after the first of the year in New York. Stay tuned. There's always more trials to come. We'll have you back to tell us about them. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.